You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. My Redeemer, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. My Redeemer, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. My Redeemer, you are worthy to be praised. Father Almighty, you are worthy to be praised. Ancient of days, you are worthy to be praised. Unchangeable changer, you are worthy to be praised. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. King of glory, we thank you for everything you've done for us since the beginning of the year. Thank you for January. Thank you for February. Thank you for March. Thank you for April. Thank you for May. And now, Father, thank you for June. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Thank you for the past. Thank you for the present. Thank you for the future. Thank you because we know that by your special grace, our tomorrow will be all right. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Today, my Father and my God, in the lives of every one of us, your children, let every storm be stilled. Yeah. And we are praying especially for your children born in the month of June. Father, what you did on this sixth day, you said was very good. These are your children who are born in the sixth month. I pray that from now on, their testimonies will always be, God has been very good unto me. Give them a new beginning, a new beginning of joy, of success, of promotion, of anointing of a hunger to serve you. Lord God Almighty, let it be well with them. And I pray that during this particular Holy Ghost service, you will reveal yourself to us like never before. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let someone shout hallelujah. I wave to two or three people and say, God bless you mightily, my friend. Amen. So you may please be seated. Uh, for July, the Holy Ghost service team will be the same as the theme for the Disciples Convention, because the Disciples will be having their convention in July, and we expect everybody who had ever been to the School of Disciples, or anyone who is currently in the School of Disciples, to be present at their convention. The theme will be Perfect blessings. Perfect blessings. That's the theme for July. It's God bless you, part seven. And we all know that seven stands for perfection. And we'll be discussing perfect blessings. 
As for today, we all, we've been told that uh, our theme is Peace Be Still. And uh, our young adults have done tremendously well again, as usual. I just thank God on your behalf that every time you had improved on the previous ones. And I can assure you, things will continue to get better and better for you. In Jesus' mighty name. Our text today, my own text, and uh, I'm sure you know that when this young adults come, they, they load us with Bible knowledge. They show us how much they have learned. I'm always looking forward to when they will be coming up. Uh, I'm looking forward to when they will come up in August during the convention, when they will probably be loading us up again with scriptures upon scriptures as we discuss a new wave of glory. And then after August, I will eagerly be waiting for October when they will come up again and uh, bless us like never before. As for today, my own text will be Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis 1, verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God bless you, part six. Now we've already learned that when we say God bless you, it means the almighty God will summon all the forces in heaven, on earth, even underneath the earth, to come to your aid. Now, we have been looking at the meaning of that original blessing, one by one. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, and now we've come to subdue. Now, the word subdue actually means bring under control. Bring under control. It means quieting. It means still. S-T-I-L-L. -L. In other words, if you are blessed with all forces in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth, cooperating with you, you can steal any storm. You can. You see, physically, when we talk about a storm, a storm is usually formed when the wind and water begin to work together in a very forceful 
a regular manner. When they want to say a storm arose, they mean it's another way of saying the wind was contrary. And that's why you find that when you are sick, when you have a physical storm in your body, the two principal things that the doctors check is how are you breathing? And they take a sample of your blood. Blood representing the water in your body. The breathing represents the wind or the air. Why is coronavirus so frightful? It is because it attacks the breathing of the victim. That's why you find that the principal thing they go for in the treatment of coronavirus is oxygen. They want to make sure that at least this fellow is breathing. Before they even try whatever else they want to try. If there is any storm physically in your body, even as you are listening to me now, I decree, peace be still. Amen. If there's anything wrong with your blood, uh, with your breathing, breathing, I decree in the name that's above every other name, peace be still. Amen. Now, if a storm is principally made up of the wind and the water, and you are blessed, that means you have Jesus Christ on your side. And with Jesus Christ on your side, according to Mark chapter 4, from verse 35 to 41, Mark 4, 35 to 41, it means you have on your side the one who the wind and the sea must obey. The wind and the sea obey him. So you are blessed means you have on your team. You have someone backing you up who the wind must obey, the sea must obey. Your breathing must obey him. Why is the one who gave you breath? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis 2, verse 7. You became a living soul only after he breathed into you the breath of life. So that breath must obey him. As for your blood, it must obey him. Why? The Bible said he has made all men, black, white, yellow, green, of one blood. So he gave you your breath, he gave you your blood. The wind and the sea must obey him. Your breathing, your blood must obey the Lord Jesus Christ because you are blessed. And so as the Lord leaves before this service is over, 
every storm in your body shall be stilled. Amen. Now, with the almighty God backing you up now, it follows that if there is any storm generated by enemies that are being in your generations, the storm can be stilled. Let me give you one or two examples. Consider Exodus chapter 14. Read the story from verse 1 to 28, Exodus 14. From verse 1 to 28. The children of Israel had just escaped from Egypt. They were on their way to the promised land. The enemies of their fathers, who had been their enemies for more than 400 years, decided to pursue. They caught up with them at the Red Sea. How were they able to overcome that storm? And that was a big storm. Read the story very well. The Bible said, when Moses lifted up his hand toward the Red Sea, the wind blew. This wind blew across the sea, and the sea parted. The wind obeyed God. The wind cooperated with Moses. The sea obeyed. Why did the sea obey? Because according to Job chapter 38, from verse 8 to 11, Job 38 from verse 8 to 11, the Bible says, it is God who gave commandment to the sea and said, thus far shall you come. And no further. When the sea is coming, with its proud waves, rushing, and you think that it's going to overwhelm the earth. God said, no, -uh, this is the beach. Thus far you will come and no further. The sea obeyed after the wind blew. The wind that can blow upon the sea to cause a storm blew on the sea and created a path. By the following morning, when they look back, the enemy they saw the night before were no more. May I decree in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, every enemy that has been in your generations causing storms, you will never see them again. Yeah. I'll see another example of storm being stilled because water obeyed. Second Kings chapter 2, from verse 19 to 22. Second Kings 2, 19 to 22. The Bible said Jericho had been under a curse for generations. City beautiful, but steadily a curse that had been pronounced on the city by Joshua, kept on walking. Elijah came on the scene. The people, the elders of the city came to him and said, help us. He collected salt from them, went to the source of the river, poured in the salt, and commanded the water, the water, Water, you are healed. 
From now on, no more death, no more barrenness. And immediately the water was healed. I'm asking my God, the one who called me, to go to the source of your river and command it that from now on, you are healed. Amen. Is there any storm that is being generated by your peers in your place of work? Is there any storm being generated in your office, in your business? Because you are blessed, because all forces in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth are to cooperate with you. The storm can be stilled. Let's give just one example we'll do. Daniel chapter 6. You can read it from the beginning to the end. Daniel 6, from the beginning to the end. It was the peers of Daniel that said, let's get him into trouble. Let us see if we can separate him from his God. Because that's the only way we can catch him. You know the story. They conspired. They got Daniel through into the den of lions. But Daniel came out alive. And at the end of the day, those who threw him into the den ended up in the den. You see, if your peers decided to start a storm for you, there's someone called the Lion of Judah. Revelation chapter 5 from verse 1 to 5. Revelation 5 from verse 1 to 5. He will support you because you are blessed. And the lions obey him. Lions may not want to obey you, but they will obey the lion of Judah. They obey him to the letter. First King chapter 13. First King 13 from verse 1 to 26. You can read that story there. A prophet disobeyed God. And God decided to show him, ah, this is not the way things should be done. A lion came and killed him. But God told the lion, don't eat him. All I want you to do is kill. And the lion obeyed to the letter. Not only that, Daniel said, when the king came in the morning to say, Daniel, the God you are serving, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel answered, uh, the, king, uh, Daniel answered the king and said, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel to stop the mouth of the lions. When you are blessed, angels support you. Because everything in heaven or not and underneath the earth are asked to cooperate with you. Angels come because angels must obey the one who is called the Lord of hosts. Psalm 24, verse 10. Psalm 24, verse 10. Angels form the host of heaven, the principal host in heaven, and they obey their commander in chief. When you are blessed, even the king, whether a heathen king or not, will cooperate with you. 
Because the king now said, bring out Daniel and bring all his enemies and let them pay a visit to the den of lions. Read the book properly and you will discover that from that day onward, nobody troubled Daniel. May I decree to someone today that after today's service, no one will trouble you again. Amen. That the storm that the Almighty God is stealing in your life today will be stilled permanently. Amen. I'm sure you will remember the testimony of a child of God who was given a sack letter because the superiors conspired against him. They gave him a letter of termination of appointment. It happened to be a Holy Ghost night. He brought the letter to the Holy Ghost service. And the word of God came and said, there's someone who has just received a letter of termination. And God said, I'm going to change that to promotion. He, of course, he knew he was the only one present. In the meantime, the bosses, those who are just above him in grade, who conspired against him, took the list of the people they were sacking to the chairman of the company. Sir, because of the downturn in the economy, we have to let some people go. The chairman said, that's, that's all right. And then they gave him the list. And he began to look through the list and came to the name of, of this child of God. And I said, ah, what about this fellow? Why are you sucking him? Oh, because we, we don't need uh, somebody in this kida. And the chairman said, well, if you have no place for somebody in that kida, what about upstairs? Move him higher. They had no choice. They thought they were destroying him, but he became their equal. They could no longer trouble him. In the name that's above every other name, anyone who is trying to keep you down, you will even become superior to them. Yeah. Are you in a storm just because you refuse to compromise? Because that's another way storms can come. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And as if you read this, the story in Daniel chapter 3, you can read it from verse 1 to the end, Daniel 3, from verse 1 to the end. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got into a very fiery storm simply because they refused to bow to idols. We are children of God. We can't do this. And some of you know what I'm talking about. In your place of work, there will be bosses who will say, unless you do the following, unless you cut corners, unless you compromise, and then you as a child of God say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my God won't allow that. Okay, let your God feed you. If they throw you into the fairy furnace, the fourth man, we show up. Yeah. The one who is called the Son of God, the Word from the beginning, the one who, according to Psalm 46, verse 1, Psalm 46, verse 1, is called the ever present help in trouble. The one who, according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5, the one who says, I am the inseparable friend. I will never leave you 
I will never forsake you. Friends may not be willing to follow you into the fairy furnace, but I'll be there waiting for you. And you know what? Fire will cooperate. Because if you are blessed, everything that God had made must cooperate with you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. Isaiah 43, verse 2. He said, you, even when you are passing through fire, it won't burn you. And you know, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fairy furnace, they were promoted. It's, qu it's quite a while now that this happened, but some of you who are old enough will probably remember the testimony of one of the children of God. He is working in one of the security apparatus in the country. And so his testimony cannot be uh, shared uh, in detail. But he was in charge of a big institution belonging to this uh, security apparatus. And he had to handle quite a lot of money. And the bossy said, you are not supposed to be spending all this money on drugs. Who is coming to check? Give us our own share. And he said, I can't do this. <laughs> I am a child of God. This money must be used for whatever it was uh, budgeted. He said, is that so? He said, yes. Well, okay. We will see to that. And he came to the Holy Ghost service. And he didn't know that a meeting was being held by his superior officers that he must be retired. Get him out of the way so we can get somebody there who will cooperate. And the wind blew. And the word of God came. And they will gather together against you. But not by me. And they that gather against you will fall for your sake. I don't want to go into too much detail so you don't begin to guess the apparatus we are talking about. But the wind blew. And by Monday, every one of those senior officers who attended the meeting, everyone was removed. <laughs> and my son was placed at a level where nobody could bother him again. I decree today, one more time, Every enemy causing storms in your life, you will never see them again. Amen. Is there a storm brewing against your destiny? Ah. Whether you know it or not, the devil has a rough idea of what God wants to do with your life. He has a rough idea. He might not know all the details. <laughs> but he has a rough idea. And some of you don't know why you have faced so many obstacles from your youth till now. It is because the enemy has a rough idea where God is taking you to. And whether the devil likes it or not, the purpose of God for your life shall be fulfilled. Yeah. When you read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and you can read it from verse 1 to 51, 1 Samuel 17 from verse 1 to 51, you need to read it with understanding. 
that David had no problems until he was anointed to be king in the previous chapter. He was always in the field, looking after his father's flock, singing psalms, playing his harp, just having a wonderful time. And then all of a sudden, Samuel came to town. And the whole city shook. Everybody knew Samuel came to town. So the devil knew. And whether you believe it or not, he was hanging around <laughs> to see who is the fellow they are going to make king now. And he saw it was David. Oh, okay. It wasn't long after that that he sent a lion to kill him. He knew the boy would stand up to the lion. The lion came, took one of the uh, flock, a sheep out of the flock. He knew the boy. The boy attacked the lion. He expected the lion to win, but the lion lost. So he decided to try a bear. The bear came, and the bear lost. So he said, all right, I know what I will do. If you get close to this enemy I'm sending, and you are punching them to death, I will send you one that you can't get close to. That's why he sent Goliath. Oh, many of you don't understand that it is the devil who spoke to J.C., send this boy to the battlefront. David wasn't in the army. He was in the bush looking after sheep. But the devil was sure if this boy gets to the battlefront and hears the challenge of Goliath, he will want to defend his God. The devil knew that for sure. And look at this, the old story. That section of it that I enjoyed the most was when David said, I come in the name of the Lord. I am a representative of the Lord of hosts that you have defied. And then he slung a rock towards the head of Goliath. And like I've taught you in the school of disciples, if anybody sees a rock coming towards his head, you see anything coming to your face, you, the, everybody wants to protect the eyes. You, without thinking, you will bend your head because you see the rock coming. How come Goliath could not bend? Because two giant hands kept his head straight, waiting for the rock. Because that was not an ordinary rock. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. It tells us there is someone called the rock of ages. The one who is called Christ. When somebody tries to create a storm that will stand before you and your destiny, the rock of ages will come to your aid. Amen. Because when you listen to what Goliath was saying, he was saying, send somebody to fight me. If he loses, I take over his kingdom. He was after the kingdom of David but he lost his head instead. I'll give you another example. Acts chapter 16. You can read it from verse 16 to the end. Acts 16 from verse 16 to the end. Paul and Silas were minding their own business. They were doing the work of God. There was this girl who was demon-possessed, and uh, they cast out the demon out of her. As a result, they landed in jail. 
and they were asked to be kept secure in jail so that by the following day they could be dead. But Paul has just started his ministry. He still had a long way to go. And talk about a storm. If you are in prison, properly chained, with no way you can think of escaping, there is someone who can still come and make a way where there's no way because his name is the way. When they began to sing and praise God, Paul and Silas, the almighty God who was seated on his throne got up. Because the Bible says, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For he seeketh such to worship him. When you worship God sufficiently, he will stand up. <laughs> when he started walking, the earth began to shake. By the time he arrived, even the doors must obey the door. Read the story. By the end of the day, the jailer became a servant. Those people who threw Paul and Silas into prison sent the following day and said, let them go. What happened? How did they get a change of heart? Because the heart of kings are in the hands of God. And he turns it like a river. And when they came and said, let them go, Paul said, I'm not going anywhere. You threw me here? Come and take me out. In that name that's above every other name, everyone is creating a storm, trying to stop you from reaching your goal, shall be put to shame. Amen. Because when those people came to, to take Paul and Silas out of prison, they begged them to leave. I don't know if the one that God is talking to, but you know what? Your greatest enemies will come and apologize. Amen. Now, I would like to go a step deeper for the next few minutes. I know my children have done a great job and they've They've done it beautifully, and of course, they've taken some time. I want you to be encouraged. Encouraged? How? Because nothing happens except God allows it. I'm sure you know, you know that one. Whenever God allows a storm to come your way, it is for a purpose. And a good purpose at that. For example, when God allows a storm to come your way, it could be, number one, to check how solid is your foundation. It wants you to discover for yourself how solid is my foundation in the Lord. You see, in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24 to 27, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, the Lord said, the difference between a wise man and a fool is the foundation on which they have built their houses. One built on the rock, one built on sand. The two houses look pretty until the storm came. 
When the storm came, when the flood came, then the house built on the rock stood, the, ra the house built on sand fell. How solid is your foundation? God may want you to find out quickly before too late. Because if you are building on false foundation and God does not show it to you before you die, then you'll be in serious trouble. So you need to know. Do I really believe in this God? The Lord Jesus Christ. Or am I just following a multitude? If God asks you to relax in a storm, will you be able to believe him and do so? And I told you the story of my first cruise in a very large ship. I was having a nice time until all of a sudden the storm came. And it was a very violent storm. So violent, the captain called us together and told us uh, not to worry. There are 12 categories of storms. Category 1, the smallest. Category 12, the biggest. And we were only in category 10. And <laughs> And he said, don't worry, just go, just go and stay in your room. Category 10. In the middle of the ocean, you can't see land anywhere. Lord, what am I doing here? What do I do? And he said, what is it written in my word? When I was on earth and there was a storm and I was in the boat, what was it that I did? The Bible said you were sleeping. He said, ah, sleep. I jumped on my bed. Within two minutes, I was fast asleep. Each time I tell the story, somebody said, how can you do that? I've heard from him. Apart from that, what else can I do? I don't even know how to swim. Uh, if you want to swim, can you swim the ocean? By the time I woke up, the storm was over. And yet I knew a friend of mine. For the first time we traveled to America, he didn't sleep all the way. I asked him, why not? He said, ah, I want to be awake if anything should go wrong. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to jump out of the plane? God may want to check your foundation. How solid is it? Number two, he may want to teach you a lesson in faith. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, Mark 4, 35 to 41, when Christ is in the boat of your life, it cannot sink. He was sleeping. The boat was filling with water. The disciples woke him up and said, Care us not that we perish. He was, I must have wondered, what's wrong with you people? I am here. How can you perish when I am in your boat? Say, so You of little faith. How strong is your faith in God? God may want to use a storm to teach you that from now on, I won't fear any storm as long as I know that Christ is in my boat. Remember our first visit to Abonema several years ago. We were going there to start a, a branch of our church. And I gathered some 
workers together, I asked those who wanted to go with me and there were volunteers. But then just before we left, there was news that a boat capsized. In those days, you have to go by this speedboat and that some people died. So I told the people, well, you heard the news. It is where we were going that there was this uh, boat capsizing. Any of you not willing to go now, all you need to do is, we are leaving at such and such a time, just come late. That's all. When we wait and we don't see you, we will take off. One of my sons asked a question. Daddy, I said yes. Will you allow me to ride in your boat? I said, why not? Ah, he said, then I will go. I said, why? He said, because the boat in which you are is not going to capsize. He was expressing his faith in me. So how much more should you have faith in the one who controls the seas? He, God may allow a storm to come to teach you faith. Number three, he could allow a storm to give you an opportunity to do something no one had ever done before. It can allow a storm to enable you to have an insight of your potential. Matthew chapter 14, from verse 22 to 33. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. The disciples were in a boat. This time the Lord was not even in the boat. And there was a storm. And then the Lord was coming to come and join them. And they saw him walking on water and they were afraid. And he said to them, Messiah, be not afraid. And Peter said, if it is you, ask me to come to you. And the Lord said, come. And Peter jumped out of the boat. I know when people want to tell this story, they always tell the story of Peter sinking. Before he began to sink, he walked on water. He walked on water to go and meet Jesus. He did something nobody no human being had ever done before, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter discovered that if Jesus Christ says, come, you can walk on water to go and meet him. A storm can give you an opportunity to discover your potential. If a storm happens under your watch, you might pray a prayer, the kind you have never prayed before. I can tell you stories on that, but time seems to be running. Let me move on to four. It can allow a storm in your life so that it can shake away from your life things that should not be there. Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 25 all the way to 28. Hebrews 12, from verse 25 to 28. The Almighty God said, once again, I will shake the heavens. By the time I finish the shaking, the only things that will remain are those that cannot be shaken. I can allow a storm, a shaking in your life, so that what remains are only those things that cannot be shaken. Mr. Sir, what exactly are you trying to say? <laughs> 
God can allow a storm in your life so that those who are pretending to be your friends may leave. Oh, the elders have a saying that it's in time of trouble, you know your friends. When everything is going smoothly, oh, everybody is a friend. Let there be trouble. <laughs> then you will discover those who are left, those who are genuinely your friend. There was a pastor in our church. Oh, we were friends. We were friends. We did everything for him because in those days, you know, we were working in the university. We had a little more money than a pastor. When he got married, by the grace of God, we bought the end, every, every expense. When I traveled to a station, even though my village uh, is not too far, other than stay in my village, I go and spend the night with him. We were close. I thought he was one of my best friends. Then a crisis came. My father in the Lord died. And of course, there was already some rumors that maybe I would be succeeding him, etc., etc. Then my papa died. And I went to visit my friend to say, ah, our father in the Lord is dead, etc. He, he did not even allow me to say a word before he began to say, I have always hated you. Ah. What led to this? He said, look, from the moment you came to the church, you brought this, your akada, etc., etc., into the church. Hey, but what are we discussing? What led to this? Of course, I was in a storm. My father in the Lord was dead. I was in agony. I was in agony and I thought I could at least fellowship with someone I thought would be a friend for consolation. He hit me hard. He took the storm to show who and who were my friends. May I pray for you that that storm that we show you, every wolf in sheep's clothing moving in and out with you, may God send that storm quickly. Amen. Because it's better to know who are your friends. People you can go to war with. If you get to the battlefront before you discover that the people you thought are friends are no friends, it might be too late. Number five, God could send you a storm to tell you that a new beginning is around the corner. In John chapter 20, Verse 19 to 23, John 20, verse 19 to 23, the apostles were in a big, big storm. They were in a storm, big time, when the Lord was crucified. As a matter of fact, the Bible said they were hiding in a room with all doors shut for fear of the Jews. Anyone connected with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was, was, on, was in great danger. But the Lord had the reason. And they didn't believe that while they were in the room, 
he came in. And he said to them, peace be with you. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Have a new beginning. It was a storm that brought me to Jesus Christ. I'm sure some of you know the story. If you don't, well, find out. It was a storm that destroyed my pride. I was a proud, arrogant young man. <laughs> Uh, in those days, if I were going to, uh, were to introduce myself to you, uh, it won't be, you won't even believe it's the fellow talking to you now. When I came to the Redeemed Christian Church of God, when the storm brought me to the Redeemed Christian Church of God, because somebody told me that if, oh, God answers prayers there, go there, your problem will be solved. And I got there and they were talking about surrender your life to Jesus Christ, etc. I looked at them. What's wrong with these ignorant people? Do they understand that I am a lecturer from the University of Lagos? <laughs> Pray. Get my problem solved. Tell me how much I will pay. <laughs> but when the storm refused to go, one day it pierced through my thick skull. And these people are not asking for your money. All they are asking you is surrender your life to Jesus. Surrender your life to your maker. What's wrong with you? Lecturer. If you have a problem, your mathematics can solve. Finally, crushed, humbled. I found my way to the altar. And by the grace of God, he took care of the storm. It was a good storm that brings you to Jesus. Because if a storm brings you to Jesus Christ, it's bringing you to a new beginning. We've been through quite a storm recently. It appeared as if God was speaking and we were not listening. He took an elderly man to point out to me, Sir, God has been speaking. You should have noticed that a storm was coming. I said, I can't understand, sir. He said during the <laughs> December Holy Ghost service, we spoke about the great turnaround. I say, yeah. Uh, he said during the special Holy Ghost service in March, we spoke about it is time to fly. I said, that is true. And at that meeting, you announced that in August, we'll be talking about a new wave of glory. I said, that is true. How is it that you didn't know that there was going to be a new beginning? God can allow his storm to tell you there's going to be a new beginning. So be encouraged if you are passing through a storm right now because a new beginning it's around the corner. As for those of you who have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, 
Hey, you better come to him now before your storm eats. Because if he is in the boat of your life, there's no storm that can sink that boat. If he's not in your boat, when the storm hits, who are you going to call upon? You call on him by then, it will be too late. So may I encourage you now, wherever you may be, if you are in a church setting, rush to the altar now and surrender your life to the one who is the controller of storms, the prince of peace himself. And just a word from him, peace, be still, and your storm will be over. So come very, very quickly now to the altar and come and cry to the almighty God. Ask him to please save your soul, have mercy on you, and wash you clean with his blood. Ask him to come and dwell in you. Tell him you want him in the boat of your life. So that from now on, you will know it doesn't matter what storm may come. Your boat will not sink. I'm going to count from one to ten to allow you to get to that altar. As I'm counting, and as you are coming, begin to pray, calling on the Lord Jesus Christ to have mercy on you, to save your soul, to come and dwell in you. And I'm calling on all of us who are already children of the living God to pray for all the people who are rushing to surrender their life to Jesus Christ now. Those we can see and those we cannot see. Pray for them, even as I begin to count. One. Two. Three. The choice is yours. You either have him in your boat before the storm hits, or it might be too late. So come now. Four. Five. Six. Come as you are. He's ready to receive you. He receives sinners. He saves their souls. Seven. Eight. And nine. Now keep coming. If you're already on the way, if you are not at the altar yet, just keep coming. I'm going to pray now for your salvation. And the prayer will reach you wherever you are. Thank you, Father. Ancient of days, I want to thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us again today. And thank you for those who had your word and are rushing to you for salvation. Father, please receive them all. Save their souls today. Let your blood wash away their sins. Write their names in the book of life. And from now on, any time they call on you, answer them by fire. 
And later on, my Father and my God, as they join others in crying to you, please, Lord, answer their prayers too. And I pray that from now on, the storms in their lives will be stilled. Amen. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, those of you who have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you are at the altar in any of the uh, viewing centers, the counselors will be there to attend to you straight away. They will collect your name, your address, and your prayer request, and they will forward it to me. And I promise you, I will be praying for you. Those of you who are not in a church setting, I rejoice with you. I will also need the information about you, your address, and your prayer request, so that I can be praying for you. And I will encourage you, to look for a redeemed Christian Church of God somewhere near you, and there are quite a few of them near you, and tell the pastor there that you have given your life to Jesus, and he will tell you what to do next. God bless you. In a moment, we will be telling all of you what will be your prayer points, those of us who are already Christians and those of who have just joined us, pray this prayer with all your heart, and I'm sure you will have testimonies very soon in Jesus' name. I will join you now in a moment at the altar in the third, in the three by three auditorium at Redemption Camp. In the meantime, God bless you mightily. Amen. Amen. Well, let somebody shout hallelujah. Now you may want to write down your prayer points before you go to God in prayer. Prayer point number one is that you should praise the Prince of Peace. Praise the Prince of Peace. The one that the wind and the sea obey. Prayer number two, you want to thank God with all your heart. That with Jesus in your boat, the boat may be shaken, but it will never sink. Thank God. That with Jesus in your boat, the boat may be shaken, may be shaken, but it will never sink. Prayer number three will cry to God and say, Father, please let all generational storms in my life cease tonight. Let all generational storms in my life cease tonight. Then you cry to God and say, Father, 
let my faith in you remain unshakable. Let all my faith, let my faith in you remain unshakable. And then you cry and say, Father, please anything in my life that should not be there. Including those pretending to be friends. Shake them off. Anything in my life, including those pretending to be friends, that should not be there. Take them off. And then you pray and say, Father, whatever might be my hidden potentials, please activate them tonight. My hidden potentials. Abilities you have given me that I don't know I have. Activate them tonight. And then you say, Father, please give me a brand new beginning. from this moment forward. Give me a brand new beginning from now on. And then Say, Father, please let me end well. Let me end well. Finally, your own personal request. Your own personal request. Now I'm going to give you just about 15 minutes to cry to God on these points. As usual, the altar is open and you are welcome to come and speak to God on these vital issues in your life. You praise the Prince of Peace. You thank God that with Jesus in your boat, the boat may be shaken but will not sink. You cry to God that every generational storm in your life will cease tonight. You pray that your faith in the Almighty God will remain forever unshakable. 
We pray that everything in your life, including those who are pretending to be friends, everything in your life that shouldn't be there, that God will shake them out. And God will activate your hidden potentials from right now. I pray that God will give you a brand new beginning, brand new beginning. I pray that we may end well, end well. Go ahead, talk to God.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. The Almighty God will grant your request. Every generational storm in your life will end tonight. Every storm in your place of work will end tonight. By the time you resume on Monday, there will be a testimony. Every storm in your marriage will end tonight. Every storm concerning your children will end tonight. Every storm in your villages will end tonight. Every storm in your state will end tonight. Every storm in your churches will end tonight. Every potential of yours that are be hidden will be activated tonight. God will give you a brand new beginning. Your faith in God will not be uprooted. It shall be well with you. You will finish well. God will support you. He will see you through. Very soon, your testimony will be mighty. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen.